So before we start talking about water flow in soils as a complex system, let's maybe just talk about uh, pipe flow and see what we can learn from pipe flow as it applies to soil. And the example I want to use for this is whether the Dutch boy did save the village. The story there goes that a hole developed in the dike at the time when the dike was flooding. And we would have a conduit here with a radius R, which permits flow of water out of the dike. And luckily, the little Dutch boy was standing there and was able to put his thumb at the opening to hold the flood waters back. So to figure out how much water will actually flow through this pipe, we do need to know the size of it as indicated by the radius, and we need to know the length of the conduit. And we need to know how much pressure or how much force is there to drive water through this conduit. And it will turn out in this little example that it is simply the height of the water table above the conduit that determines the pressure difference, and the height here being 5 meters. So the flow of water through this kind of system can be described with what is called the hagen prezor law, which describes flow through a cylindrical pipe. So here, this is more or less a snapshot of our little conduit going through the dike. We have a perfect cylinder through which water is going to flow, and that cylinder has a radius r. And it has a length L, just like our conduit in the dike. And it has, in order to establish flow, a pressure difference between pressure going in and pressure going out. And if I say that the pressure going out is less than the pressure going in, we would have flow in this direction. Now, the hagen prezor law states that the volume of water flowing through this pipe per unit time equals pi times the radius to the fourth power, and the fourth power will become very important here shortly, divided by 8 nu, which is the viscosity of water, and remember, we learned about viscosity previously when we talked about the Stokes law. And this being multiplied by the pressure difference between the outlet and the inlet of our pipe divided by the length. And uh, in here, then, this later part of this equation will become something that we will refer to as the driving gradient. This is what is making the flow happen. So what we see in this hagen prezor equation is that the volume flowing through the pipe per unit of time is proportional to the pressure difference, meaning that the higher the pressure is, the more flow will be achieved. That makes sense. And also that that volume per time flow is going to be inversely proportional to the length, meaning the longer the conduit through the dike is, the less that volume flow is going to be which is also intuitive. Okay. So now back to our original question, whether the Dutch boy did save the village. Let's start out by calculating the driving gradient or establishing the driving gradient in the hagen prezor law. So we must have a pressure difference from left to right on our little diagram. And the pressure on the left side where the flooding waters are providing five meters of standing water can be calculated as the height of that standing water times the density of water times the gravitational acceleration. And if you calculate this out, you get to 49 kilopascals. On the right side of the dike, if the Dutch boy is not there to hold his thumb on the hole, the pressure here would simply be zero. Now you may say, well, why is it not atmospheric pressure 
and I would have to say, well, you are right, it actually is atmospheric pressure. But since we're only interested in the pressure difference from the left side of the dike to the right side of the dike, I'm uh, making the assumption that the atmospheric pressure is also acting to the same degree on the left side, and we therefore ignore it here and we just call this pressure zero. Now let's use this information in uh, the hagen pozor law. So now we are calculating the volume per time as pi times the radius of our conduit 0 0.005 meters to the fourth power divided by 8 times the viscosity, which is 8.9 times 10 to the negative fourth pascal seconds times the pressure difference, so 49,000 pascals divided by 10 meters. And if you calculate this out, you come to 104 cubic meters of water per day flowing through a pipe that's 10 meter long and has a half a centimeter radius. Now, for you Americans, this would come out to be approximately 0 0.08 acre-feet per day. Which does not seem to be enough water to have flooded the village. So, if this is all the hole that was in the dike, there was not really a need for the little Dutch boy to uh, plug his finger there to save the village. But maybe the conduit was actually a lot bigger than half a centimeter. So now let's just say, what if we double the uh, radius of the hole? So if we calculate this out, the volume per time pi times now 0.01, meters to the fourth power divided by 8 times 8.9 times 10 to the negative fourth pascal seconds times 49,000 kilopascals divided by 10 meter, you would come out to 0 0.32 acre feet per day which is four times as much water in a day than what we had previously with half the diameter or radius for the particular conduit. So what we learn from this is that we double the radius, we quadruple the flow, which is where the importance of the radius fourth in hagens pozor law comes in. The other thing that maybe we see from this is that the real reason the Dutch boy was saving the village was maybe not so much because plugging the hole with his finger prevented flow through the conduit that would have contributed enough water to flood the village, but really by plugging the hole, the little Dutch boy would have prevented further internal erosion of this conduit which would have led to that conduit increasing with size and eventually failing of the dike would have resulted in the loss of the village. So the little Dutch boy in the end was indeed a hero. So now let's take the lesson from the hagen pozor law and see if we can learn something about soils from it. So soil is a complex three-dimensional arrangement of solid particles and pores. And if we were to establish flow through the system, we now no longer just have a simple hollow cylindrical connection for water flow to occur, but we have a tortuous connected pathway which allows the flow of water from one side to the other. And the term tortuosity warrants some explanation. So here's our new term, tortuosity. And the tortuosity is the ratio of the actual path length that a water molecule may take through our porous medium compared to the straight line distance. 
where the straight line distance would simply be the distance between the inlet and the outlet in our little example. Now to make our calculations of how much water is actually going to flow from left to right in response to a driving gradient a little simpler, we're just going to simplify our soil. And we're going to say, rather than a complex three-dimensional water-filled connected pathway, we're going to have a limited number of capillaries which are going to be tortuous, and they're going to be sufficient to describe flow of water through our soils. So you might, for example, say that we have the smaller radius capillary here with a radius 1, then we have another one with the radius 2, and another one with the radius 3, and we could also assign how many of these are present in soil. So maybe there is two of the small ones, three of the medium-sized ones, and eight of the large ones. So with that, we can actually start to apply our Hagen and Pazor law. But there's one more thing we need to figure out, and that is in the Hagen and Pazor law, we were interested in how much water flows out of an individual conduit. And there we were interested in the radius of that, and with that associated is a radius. So there's the area and radius of the large size capillaries, which is going to be pi r3 squared. But for soils, looking at the outflow of individual pores is probably not going to be practical, but we probably want to look at something that averages over a certain volume of soil. And then we would be interested in looking at just a cross-sectional area of soil and we would try to quantify how much water flows out of a cross-sectional area of soil. Okay. So now let's do some complicated math on this simple example. We have our tortuous capillaries. We've established that flow happens from an area of inflow to an area of outflow, where this is the area of the soil. And we may now write our Hagen and Pussor law as volume per time equals pi r to the fourth divided by 8 nu times our driving gradient, our pressure difference over some distance l. And the distance l here is the straight line distance between the inlet and the outlet in terms of areas of our particular soil. So now we're going to do a little bit of trickery and a couple of other rearrangements to derive an equation which will describe flow of water in soil. So bear with me as we go through this. The first piece of trickery is going to be that we're going to divide this equation by the area. So we're going to divide both the left and the right side of the equation by an area. And I say trickery because the area is going to be a different area. So here we have a volume per time per area soil. And on the right side of the equation, I'm going to be looking at dividing it by the area of the individual conduits, or only the area as contributing to the outflow of soil. So this is going to be area of capillaries. And I'm going to leave our driving gradient alone for now, but we're going to be rearranging that soon as well. So now that we have three different of these capillaries and we know how many of them there are, we can express the right side of the equation as simply a summation over contributions from individual capillaries. So we're just going to write this as a sum. And it's going to be the sum of pi ri to the fourth. So this is the size of the individual capillaries divided by 8 nu. And now we also use the area of the individual capillaries. We might as well write this as pi ri squared as the area of a circle. And the only change I need to make in here is now to say, well, how many do I have of a particular size? So I'm going to add a little ni in here to say that we have two capillaries of the smallest size of radius ri corresponding to the smallest radius times that driving gradient, delta p over l. With that step, we can 
rearrange things and simplify things a little bit because not everything that is within the summation changes every time we do the summation. So the viscosity, the pressure, and the length are not going to be changing with the summation, and we might as well pull this out. So we can write it as 1 over nu times the sum of ni, and now we have pi r to the fourth divided by pi r to the second. That will simplify to simply ri squared over 8 times our driving gradient delta p over l. So when we started talking about um, the little Dutch boy, we learned that, well, the height of water and the pressure applied by that water are related with each other. So the pressure was the height of the water times rho w, the density of water, times g, the gravitational acceleration. And we might as well use this equation here and substitute it in for this pressure gradient. If we do this, we can pull the density and the gravity term forward and collect it together with the viscosity here. And then we have the sum of ni ri squared over 8 times now a change in height, not the pressure, because we replace that, over the straight line distance L. And now we have only one more thing to do, and that is, well, we haven't exactly accounted for tortuosity of these pathways. We only inserted L as the straight line distance. So if we add the tortuosity as we defined it on the previous slide in here, we would add the tortuosity down in the summation because each one of these conduits or capillaries is going to have a different tortuosity and we can account for it this way. So let's see what we've created here now. So we have a volume per area per time, which we call a flux density. So that describes how much water is coming out of a cross-sectional area of soil per time. And it's going to be a measure of the effectiveness of flow to our particular uh, soil system. The thing that we have here on the right, we already know the name for, and that is the driving gradient. And we did some manipulation here with this equation to express that driving gradient, not in terms of a pressure gradient, but in what we call a head gradient. So it's a head of water or height of water that is now driving our flow of water. And the pieces in the middle are interesting as well. So what I've collected here to the left of the summation are all properties of water. So you might call this the fluidity. So we have the density in there, we have the viscosity in there, and we have gravity sort of as a system um, describing constant in here as well. The piece that we're summing over, though, includes the size of the pores or the size of the capillaries, how many of them there are. So this links to the pore size distribution. And we have the tortuosity in there. So if we were to sum this up, we might want to call this pore structure. And now it turns out that what we have here is essentially Henry Darcy's law. And in Henry Darcy's law, these two pieces here are combined into one number. And that is called the saturated hydraulic conductivity. So the saturated hydraulic conductivity then combines the properties of the fluid of water with the properties of the soil, of the pore structure. And what it describes is the ease of water flow.
and we commonly call it KS for the saturated hydraulic conductivity in what is termed Darcy's law. And we're going to deal with Darcy's law in a separate video. But I'm going to write it out here for you so you see the similarity between what we have developed starting out with uh, first principles, so to speak, with the Hogg and Pozoil law, looking at the complex structure of soils, simplification to a bundle of capillaries, and now to this flow equation, which uh, describes how much flow we have in response to a driving gradient, and the ease of that flow being described by the saturated hydraulic conductivity, which sums up fluidity and pore structure all in one. So Darcy's law, is the volume per cross-sectional area per time. Then there is Ks, the saturated hydraulic conductivity, times that driving gradient, delta H over L. And the only thing different in Darcy's law from what we've developed here, and is a convention thing, is to put a negative sign in here, which then indicates that flow is going to be happening in the direction of flow. So the negative just takes care of that the flow actually occurs in the accurate direction as we are calculating things. So to summarize it, what we've learned is that flow of water through soils is not unlike the uh, straight uh, flow path example we had in the dike. We have flow according to a driving gradient, which is characterized by either a pressure or a head difference. And that gets divided by a straight line distance between in and out flow. And that flow is proportional to the properties of the fluid, meaning that if I have water flowing through the system, I get a higher flux density than if I were to use oil, for example. And also that that flux density is proportional to the properties of the soil and its pore structure. So the larger the pores I have, and you can see this here with the radius to the squared power, the larger pores I have, the more flow I'm going to have, and the less tortuous these pathways are, the more flow I'm going to have also. So this quite easily then links to properties uh, or to sand and silt. If you want to compare these two sand, large pores, very little tortuosity, a silt soil, small pores, and increased tortuosity, which of course then has consequences for the saturated hydraulic conductivity being a much higher value in sands than it is in silts.